Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's live Old Blue Talk. Um, if you would like to ask any questions during today's talk, please type them into the Q&A, which you can find at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those at the end. Um, I will now pass you over to today's um, speaker, Dr. Jennifer Bates, who is coming to you live from Korea. Well, thank you. I'm just going to uh, quickly share the screen so you can see the presentation. And hopefully you can see that. Gina, is that OK? Yep, all good. Perfect. Thank you. OK, so um, many thanks for inviting me to speak. And I'm actually really honoured to be able to present some of what I've been up to since I left CH in 2007. But I'm also slightly terrified at the prospect because I believe that some of my teachers are here and I suddenly feel like I'm in front of class again being asked to present my homework, but I'm gonna persevere regardless. Now, my name's Jennifer and I'm an assistant professor of archeological science at Seoul National University in South Korea. And I work on several projects ranging from Bronze Age food studies to Paleolithic refugia reconstructions. But today I'm going to talk to you about what is rather a hot topic, no pun intended, um, and that's climate change and how archaeology can contribute to helping us to build a more sustainable future by looking to the past. Now, we're fully aware that we live in a period of climate change. Anyone with a passing glance at the news lately will have seen COP26 the big global climate change conference aimed at addressing the rather concerning trend of increasing global climate temperatures and also other climate impacts we're seeing. And I'm gonna think a little bit with you about some of these issues today. But before we go anywhere near that, I want to lay down a couple of terms so that we're all on the same page. Firstly, archeology. span It's not dinosaurs, sorry. It's also not architecture or buildings. What we're doing is looking at the study of the human past. But on a more serious note, we also need to establish a couple of other terms so that again, we can have a good conversation about this. And the two terms that come up again and again are weather and climate. The biggest challenge I think we actually face really in having this conversation is when people say, well, it's snowing today or it's colder than it was yesterday or this year's wetter than it was last year. When they do this, they're talking about weather because weather is different from climate. We have to acknowledge this when we start talking to people about climate change. So what is the weather? Well, the weather is the state of the atmosphere. If it's hot, if it's cold, sunny, rainy, snowy, all of those things. It's the day-to-day -day atmospheric patterns, those short-term consequences of what's happening around us. And this is different from the climate because the climate is a long-term set of patterns in the weather, the average of what's happening over many, many years. You can't see the climate from day to day or from year to year. You have to really look at it over the long span of many, many years put together. There's a term for this that we use when we want to be fancy. We call this the long durée. But all that means is that we put all the, data, all the data together, we accumulate it, we compile it, and we look for means, variability, the pattern. So we're looking at various different things here. We could look at temperature, humidity, rainfall, the precipitation. Those are the common ones. And we start looking for these patterns. The shortest span that we can do this is about 30 years, but the more data you have, the better the resolution of your picture and the more you can see those patterns emerging, the stability or the instability and the change from the norm. Now in this graph that you can see here, we've got the global temperatures since about 1880 AD and they're being compared with the long-term average to see the trends. And you'll notice that there are some good years and some bad years if we were to compare them one to the other. But the important bit here is how far it varies from that long term average. And you'll notice that in recent years, things have been getting hotter and hotter compared with that average. 
Now, the more data we have, the better we get a sense of the long term patterns. And if you look at this kind of thing, we'll see really dramatic changes over long term data. This is from ice cores spanning back to the Pleistocene. So over periods of thousands of years, this is actually, I think it's 400,000 years worth of data at the top. And you can see ice ages starting to emerge in this in terms of global temperatures. I've pulled out from this as well at the bottom, the Holocene, that's the age that we live in now. And there are some small subtle differences in here. And that's where we start to get into some of the interesting patterns to talk about. Things like the Younger Dryas, a period of colder climate that people have hypothesized has important impacts on human land use and economies changing and also the 4.2K event in the Northern Hemisphere. But I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about how it's been implicated in some Bronze Age social change. But while we can establish what climate is and how it's been changing over time, perhaps more importantly is, what is this change being caused by? Why is it being driven? And this is what conferences like COP26 are trying to deal with and what I want to talk to you today about. Why is climate changing? There are multiple possible drivers behind climate change and these could be real physical mechanisms. People have cited things like um, the rotational shifts in the earth for some of the big patterns we see. It could also be catastrophic events in the short and midterm. Things like a volcanic eruption creating dust clouds that interfere with atmospheric systems. But it could also be the impact of things like gases, methane and CO2. And this is where I come to other drivers, other causes and something called the Anthropocene debate. And just to explain what you're seeing in this graph here, this is the carbon dioxide levels over the last 800,000 years. And you can see how they're fluctuating, how they're wobbling around. And that's kind of what we expect. But you'll notice at 1950, suddenly they shoot up, they dramatically skyrocket past anything we've ever seen before in any proxy we look at, any kind of data we look at. And this is why people are starting to ask, could humans be responsible for climate change, for causing things that are driving climate change, like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and also other ecological impacts on our planet? And this is where the Anthropocene debate comes in. It's born out of a really nerdy geological discussion about how we define the ages that we live on this planet. In the early 2000s, an atmospheric chemist called Paul Crutzen um, suggested that maybe the influence of human behavior on the Earth's atmosphere in the past few centuries has been so significant, it might constitute a new geological age. So we're dividing time here into eras, ages, epochs, whatever term you want to use, but into things that leave a permanent mark on the earth. So we've got, for example, the Paleozoic eras, that means old life, things where you get trilobites, um, coal forests, for example. Then we've got the Mesozoic, that's your dinosaurs. I know I said we don't do dinosaurs, but there you go, there's your dinosaurs. And then we've got the Ocenes. These are the, um, the new ages. So we've got the Pleistocene, for example, where we saw those nice wobbles in our climate curve and the Holocene, which is what we live in now. But geologists and other scientists have started to argue that maybe humans have had such an impact that we can now mark a new geological age, an Anthropocene. Anthrop meaning human, a human new age. Have we changed this planet enough to create an entirely human defined age? Now, there are lots of ways we could measure this um, and different disciplines within academia, for example, will give you their opinion on what we should be looking at. We can argue about this for hours or for years as we have been doing, but generally we agree on three things. Firstly, it needs to be a global impact and it needs to start at roughly the same time. We should be seeing this happening everywhere, not just in one region. Secondly, it has to be something that's on the same kind of scale as a geological scale. So all the other ages are defined by marks in the rock. 
So this has to be something that is significant like that. We've kind of persuaded the geologists that it doesn't need to be a rock change. We've kind of got them beyond this, but it still needs to be that kind of significant impact. And so thirdly, it has to leave a trace. It can't just be an idea. It has to be something we can go out and we can measure. So those are the agreed on things. Global, big impact and measurable. And there's lots of things we could look at. We could look at our nuclear impact, for example. We could look at plastics. We could look at human impacts on species diversities and even species biology. We could look at fossil fuel burning, land use change. The list is vast because that's what humans have done. But the big problem is not all of these individual things are happening at the same time. Not all of them have the same kind of levels of impact and not all of them are happening necessarily globally at the same time. So we have an issue. When does the Anthropocene begin? And it's important because the Anthropocene leads us to questions about our climate change modeling. If human impact on the earth is so great, we're gonna define a new geological era, something so big it leaves traces globally, etc then that has an impact for how we think about our future impact going forward. If it's a nuclear revolution, for example, how do we handle our nuclear waste moving forward? If it was the advent of fossil fuel burning, maybe we should think really hard about how we go ahead curtailing this and doing something different. If it was the advent of land use change, well, maybe we need to look at how we're feeding ourselves, for example. And if it's just the sheer fact that we spread everywhere and started messing up the ecology, how do we deal with this? Understanding the Anthropocene and our long-term impacts on this planet are critically important to our climate change discussions. And this is kind of where archaeology comes in. Not to sound big-headed, but we're the discipline that can help here. So the climate modelers and the natural scientists, they are crucial. Obviously, in a climate change debate, they're the ones that are giving us the data about what's actually happening. The geographers, the anthropologists, the social scientists, they're telling us about what people are doing right now. And the geologists and the paleontologists give us the past long-term climate story right back deep in time. But the only ones that intersect all of this are us, the archeologists. We give people that long durée story of how humans lived in the past, how climate change impacted them, and how humans might have caused climate change. We're kind of the bit in the middle that links everyone together. So this is basically my job, or at least part of it. I consider the implications of climate change from that long-term perspective and how humans fit into the story. I provide the narrative um, based on data for various time periods about what happened during periods of climate change and also perhaps about the lessons we should be learning. So I'm gonna give you an example of this. I'm gonna give you an example of how a civilization faced a period of climate change, how people dealt with this. That's kind of the lesson from the past. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how archeologists are providing data, providing information, both for the Anthropocene debate, but also for those climate modelers to try and help us in our current challenge. So let me introduce you then to our case study. This is the Indus civilization. This is one of the places that I work. It covers modern day Pakistan, bits of India and Afghanistan. It's what we would call a great old world Bronze Age civilization. It's contemporary with Egypt and Mesopotamia, but as you can see, it's kind of a lot bigger than that. Um, in fact, you can comfortably fit Egypt and Mesopotamia in the same space that the Indus would fit and have room for the later time period Shang that I've also put on the map. It's kind of big. But weirdly, the Indus is under-researched in comparison with Egypt and Mesopotamia. And I'm kind of betting here that most of you have heard about Egypt and Mesopotamia, possibly the Shang, but probably not the Indus. And I think that's actually really kind of sad because the Indus has lots of really cool stuff, lots of this shiny material culture that's really interesting in terms of those kinds of studies, but archeologically it's fascinating in terms of its social organization. Um, we have all sorts of questions remaining. 
And in terms of the climate debate, the Indus is the place to go looking. To give you a bit of a chronology, um, so that you understand what time period we're dealing with here, the Indus starts around about 3200 BC, and by about 1500 BC, it's well and truly ended. But we're going to look at the time period in the little green box that's the late Harappan period. This is the time period after it started to de-urbanize, to decline, to change. And that starts at around 1900 BC. Now, just before this, when it's a big urban happy Bronze Age civilization, just before 1900 BC, we see a nice big complex Bronze Age world with a highly developed economy, a complex social structure, really interesting politics, and something that we're not quite sure going on religiously and ideologically. It's all diverse, it's interconnected, and it is so complex that we're actually having a bit of a time trying to figure all of this out. That's what I spent the rest of my time trying to do, is trying to work this out. But around about 1900 BC, we start to see some big changes happening. We see the abandonment of these cities that I've highlighted here. People start to move into new areas. They start moving away from Punjab and Sindh into these new areas. And the culture, it starts to change and becomes more sort of broken into new things. One of them is called Cemetery H, one of them is called Jukar, one of them is called Rangpur, based on their differences. To give you an idea of what's actually happening in the cities as they're declining and people are abandoning them, well, this is Mahindradaro, and it's a good example. We see structures like this great bath and the stupa in the background gradually being abandoned over a period of maybe 100 years or so. And the Indus is really renowned for its complex and very well established and organized social structures in the city. So for example, they have a really well established system of sanitation. So beautiful brick line drains and wells to get people fresh water and to remove waste. And these just aren't maintained over that 100 year period as the city starts to be abandoned. And it suggests that something weird is happening and that people just aren't taking care of themselves. And we see this in the material culture as well. The technical term is the disappearance of technical virtuosity. It just means that things start to change and they don't look as nice anymore. We see elaborate crafts starting to disappear. The script is no longer used. They're not writing anymore. There's no more stamp seals. So there's no more administration going on. Things like the weights, the shared weight system for measuring things out, that's no longer used. Pretty jewelry like the stoneware bangles and the long barrel carnelian beads. The technology to make those is just forgotten and things like figurines are no longer being made. And overall, people have suggested that this is a transformation at the heart of what it is to be Indus. The ideological core of the Indus kind of becomes a bit nihilistic and breaks down. And in essence, we see a collapse or an end, a change in the socio-cultural fabric of what it is to be Indus. So that's what's happening around about 1000, starting at 1900 BC. And the big question we have to ask is, why did this happen? Why did the Indus end? And there were lots of possible reasons. People have suggested, originally suggested, when we first started excavating this in the 1920s, that it was an invasion, a catastrophic end. We've kind of abandoned that line of thinking now because there's no evidence. Um, but other people have suggested things like social evolution, population increases, resource ex exhaustion. But the big theory that's going around at the moment is this one that I probably wouldn't phrase quite as dramatically as this but it certainly encapsulates it. 200 year drought doomed the Indus civilization. This rather dramatic headline is alluding to the idea that around about 2200 BC, so just before the end, we see a climate change event. This climate change event is called the 4.2K event. That just means 4,200 years ago, so 2200 BC. And the 4.2K event is something that doesn't just affect 
South Asia. It's affecting the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. And it's basically a change in the rainfall. So it's a rainfall-based climate change event, possibly also a warming event, but we need more data on the temperatures. We see several of these kind of little climate change events happening throughout the Holocene. So there's one at 8.2, one at 5.2, but it's this event at 4.2 that people are really interested in because the 4.2K event kind of correlates, so it lines up with some big changes in a lot of Bronze Age civilizations across the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. So the Indus is one of them. Bits of Egypt and Mesopotamia are also changing. So the big question that people have put forward is, does the 4.2K event cause the end of the Indus? And this is kind of where people either leap into headlines like 200 year drought doomed the Indus, or they start asking questions like, well, what exactly is the 4.2K event? When exactly does it happen? And then we can start worrying about, does it cause things? And it's that question that we have to deal with first, what is actually happening before we get anywhere near, does it cause the end? So one of the things that we know is that there is some kind of global event happening around about 4,200 years ago. And we know this because we have a lot of data points. And you can see here, these are all of the climate-based data points that we have across the globe. And you'll notice that there are a lot of them around North America and Northern Europe. Um, there's quite a few of them um, sort of in sea-based areas. Um, and this is because the kind of data that we're using is often ice core data, lake core data, or sea core data. So taking sediments or ice cores. But you'll also notice that there are only a few points from South Asia. And while I said that, you know, we want to have long-term trends in global climate, we also need to have local data. And this is because while climate and weather are slightly different, Climate is the trend of what's happening in weather systems. And everywhere in the world has its own local weather-based system. And in South Asia, we have two particular kinds of rainfall. One is the winter rains and one is the Indian summer monsoon. We need to understand what's happening in the Indian summer monsoon in particular, because that's the main amount of rainfall, by, because of the 4.2K event. So having all of this wonderful climate data, which is amazing and we need it and we need to keep getting more, is really useful, but we need to get this data from the local areas as well to really understand what impact a global climate event has on local weather systems as well. So we need to get some data from South Asia. Trying to get a bit closer to South Asia to try and sort of pin down the effects, people started turning to anywhere they could find information. And the first place they looked was the Arabian Sea. And this is because as you change your rainfall, you are eroding sediments off, um, off the earth into rivers. These then take the sediments down and they dump it into the sea. And this kind of builds up layers. The more rainfall you have, the more sediment is being eroded, the more is being dumped. So you get a thick layer of sediment. If there's less rainfall, there should be a thin layer of sediment and you basically get a barcode and you've got an example here. So you should be able to read how thick or thin the layers are and work out whether or not you've got periods of lots of rain or very little rain. And you can see in the first column a period that's got fairly good rainfall and next to it a time period where there's very little rainfall because there's thin lines. So that's the theory. So people turned to the Arabian Sea, these are people like Struvasa, and they were looking at it and they said that, well, based on the sea data, we see a time period of decreased sediment, so thin lines, between 2400 and 1750 BC. This suggests that we've got a period of less rain, more arid climate. And that's great, that tells us something is happening. But there's some problems with this because erosion can change for many reasons. Rivers can change course. 
Um, we know this, especially with the Indus River, which is the river creating these sea cores. Um, it did a spectacular jump and caused all sorts of problems um, in 2010 and 2012. Um, so maybe there's less sediment because the river's moving sediment to elsewhere in the sea. And seas are complicated places. They turn sediment around all the time. And the other problem is that, well, 2400 to 1750 BC, that's 600 years. That covers everything from our urban period right the way till after the end of the Indus. Can we really link a giant set of data to a really specific end of a civilization? We need better data. So people have started looking elsewhere. You'll also notice that the two red dots, those are our sea cores. They're still quite far away from the land that we're trying to look at. So people started looking for data inside the Indus. And the blue dots and the two yellow dots, those are where people looked. And these are what we call lakes, playa lakes specifically. So playa lakes are dry lake beds. They're they used to be proper full lakes, but when there wasn't enough rain, eventually, or the lake's um, river source that fed them moved, they dry out um, and they become these sort of giant, great big alkali salt pans. They're quite unpleasant places to walk around. Um, they can be quite sort of damaging to the skin if you're not careful. But if you get the right kind of lake, you can harvest salt. It's a very weird ecosystem, but they're great for our purposes because they serve as traps for all kinds of climate-based data. And one of the cool ones that they serve as a trap for is pollen. Now, pollen comes from plants, obviously, um, and plants react to the amount of rainfall that they're given. Certain plants need really damp environments, certain plants need really dry environments. So over time, and remember we're dealing with hundreds of years, the different kinds of plants that are in the area will change depending on the amount of rainfall in the region. So we should see changes in the kinds of pollen we're getting depending on the climate. And this is what people like Prasad and Enzel tried to do. They looked at the pollen levels. They also looked at a bit of soil buildup, that same kind of sediment layering, to see what was going on in the rainfall. And they showed some really cool things. They showed the fluctuating levels throughout the Holocene. They showed when the lake levels were really high. They showed changing rainfall throughout um, the early Holocene. But right when we need the data, and here's the radiocarbon dates, right when we need it, there's no pollen, which is a problem. Because we need to know what plants are in the area to know what the rainfall is like. And there's no pollen because when the lake dries out, the pollen gets destroyed. So this is a real problem. Pollen is not gonna help us. We still haven't got any idea what is actually happening in the Indus region right at the moment we need to get some data. This huge gap is really an issue. And this is where a project that I've been involved with is trying to sort the mess out because the global data is a bit fuzzy. We don't actually know what's happening. The lake pollen data is a bit of a mess because we've got gaps and the Arabian Sea core data is huge time wise. So the project that I'm involved with, land water settlement and two rains, is trying to figure it all out by going back to these lakes and looking at different kinds of data. And here you can see Yama Dixit and also Cameron Petrie getting those samples. Now, what Dr. Yama Dixit has done is she's used lots of different kinds of data to make sure that our record is going to be complete, using things like the soil layers, but also isotopes, ostracods and shells. She managed to get the first full sequence for climate data for South Asia in this area. And what she's shown is that the 4.2K event causes a collapse of the Indian summer monsoon. Some other work by Dr. Elena Geish has also managed to support this with some pollen sequences from a slightly better preserved lake and also a speleothert therm, which is like a, a cave um, core. I'm not a specialist in that, that's Elena's thing. But what they've managed to show, Elena and Yama, 
is that the Indian summer monsoon collapses at around about 4,200 4, uh, 4, to 4,100 years ago. This is right before the end of the Indus, literally a hundred or so years before things start to go wrong. That loss of the Indian summer rainfall, it must be the cause of the end of the Indus, right? Climate change must cause collapse. But this is again where we need to be cautious. I love this graph. This is one of my favorite graphs of all time because what you can see here is current sort of modern global temperature increases being directly correlated against something. We can see a beautiful upward curve and it suggests that whatever this is being correlated against, temperature is causing an increase. This is correlation causing a change, right? Well, this curve is actually showing us global temperature against the number of pirates being recorded. And it's a really good lesson to remind us that just because you have a correlation, a link on a graph between two things, doesn't necessarily mean that one thing is causing the other. It doesn't necessarily mean that the increase in global temperatures is causing an increase in pirates. Any more that we can assume that the correlation between a climate event and the end of the Indus means that climate change caused the end of the Indus. We have to actually test the hypothesis that climate change caused the end of the Indus. We have to think about why this might be. This is fairly easy to actually test to a certain extent. We have to look at various things, but one of the things we can look at is the amount of water actually being used by people. So this is some work that's being done by Dr. Penny Jones on our project, and she's using isotopes. You don't have to worry about the technicals of this. All you need to know is that plants obviously react to water, and they do this at a very atomic level. When stressed, a plant will fractionate, and that's the technical term, but it will take in different amounts of heavy and light carbon isotopes. We can measure that, and that's the important bit, we can measure it, and see how stressed a plant was. Now, in theory, the plants should become more stressed after the end of, uh, towards the end of the Indus, because we know the 4.2K event is causing there to be less rainfall. So this is Penny's data. What Penny's done is she's looked at several different sites and she's looked at different kinds of crops before and after the 4.2 collapse of the summer monsoon. Anything towards the bottom of the graph is stressed. Anything at the top is not stressed. And those that have got eagle eyes will have noticed a trend. You'll notice that there's no increase in water stress across the 4.2K event. This is really strange. There's no seemingly stress amongst these plants. They've got enough water. In fact, at Harappa, there seems to be an increase in the amount of water available for wheat and barley after the collapse of the Indian summer monsoon. And Penny's arguing, and she looks at multiple plants, this is the summer pulses as well, she argues that there's no increase for water stress despite the rainfall decline when the Indus civilization declines. And she's arguing that this is not because there's a lack of climate change, but perhaps it might be because Indus farming is resilient and that maybe we need to look a little bit more detail at what farmers are doing. So water stress alone might not have been a critical component in why this civilization ends. The 4.2K event is, might be a bit more complicated. It's not just about the amount of water that, people, that crops get, but about the way people think about their plants and the different ecological needs those plants have relative to what people are doing. So things like wheat and barley, they're fussy. They need lots of environmental niceties. They like a lot of water, they like a good environment. But the good thing about them, even if they're fussy, is they give you a lot of food. They're high yielding. People like them, especially if you're living in an urban environment, because you can feed a lot of people. But that's a risk 
because if it goes bad in terms of the environment, the rainfall, well, are you going to be able to keep growing them? Something like millet, however, is really resilient. It's hardy. It's adapted to a bad environment, to poor years, to arid conditions, neglect even. So it's a good famine food, but it won't give you a lot of grain. So these are the kinds of things that people have to think about when they're growing their food. When we start looking at the data, we start to see these kinds of choices that people are making. This is the city of Harappa, for example, and people are having to rely on 90% of their food coming from wheat and barley, this high yielding crop that likes a lot of water. But during the late Harappan period, that post climate change event, we see a slight change. It's only 5%, but 5% more millet could have been disastrous. We know from the skeletal data that people were on the margins of malnutrition all the time at these sites, um, even during the good years. So 5% increases in millet might have been an issue. But why were they doing this if they were able to water their crops as Penny has shown us? Well, it might have been a balance between having to deal with things like demand and also things like the whole network that these sites are linked into. Sites are not just sites on their own. Cities don't live in an isolation. A civilization is a network. Any decision or choice made by one site will have an effect on another site. Ripples happen across a civilization. And we know from looking at other places that some of the supply sites for these cities are making decisions that may not be the best interests for the city, but are certainly helping people living outside them. This is Kanma and Kisara. These are agricultural sites. We see them making changes based on their perception of the environment. They're still growing the wheat and the barley during this climate change event, and we know they're still putting a lot of water in to keep doing this. And it's probably not for themselves. They're probably only growing the wheat and the barley to feed the cities. That's where Harappa is still getting most of its wheat and barley from but you'll see a big change between the blue and the orange in these um, pie charts by Picaria and their colleagues. This is the work they've done. These sites are starting to think more about themselves than they are about feeding the city during this time period. They keep growing things for the city, they keep watering them, which is why Penny can see that in her data, but for themselves, well, they start growing that arid adapted millet and it's just not providing enough food. And slowly the amount of millet that's given to the cities as well as that wheat increases and the malnutrition cycle happens and people just cannot survive. This is a general trend we see across the Indus. It's a slow, small margin, but that margin is critical. So climate change doomed the Indus then. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. And that's kind of my takeaway message here. This is the lesson bit. That wasn't the lesson, this is the lesson. It's not that climate change has to cause the end of a civilization, but the parts of the Indus were actually prepared for this. They were resilient. This is Masudpa. This is representative of the kind of sites that I look at. Unlike Harappa, unlike Kanma and Kisara, this site and the other ones I've been looking at were actually using a very different strategy. Here you can see the wheat and the barley, but they're also using things like the millet, they're using rice as well, they're using the tropical pulses. And this is a mix of crops that creates a very different set of expectations and choices that the farmers have. They're adapted for good years with the wheat, the barley and the rice, but they've got backups for the bad years in the millet and the beans. And they're doing this right from the very beginning of the Indus when the years are good, and it means that by the time they get to the bad years, they're prepared. And we're seeing this at other places. This is Shikarpa, for example. So this flexible system, this diversity, this plasticity in farming and diets is something that we have to recognize from the past and build into our own systems. We're monocropping, monoculturing too much, three major cereals, wheat, rice and maize. But there's a whole range of other things we could be using that we know we used to use globally, not just in the Indus. And the way that we're growing them 
Well, we could change that. This is a lesson from the past that shows us it doesn't have to be this way. Masudpur, Shikarpa, they all survived the end of the Indus. We need to think about this and change the way we're doing it. And this kind of brings me back very briefly at the end to the Anthropocene. I want to talk about another project that I'm working on that's taking these kinds of lessons from the past to help our future. We have this debate surrounding what the Anthropocene is, as I mentioned earlier, and COP26, thinking about climate change and how we need to urgently model it before what we've done to this planet comes back and bites us in the proverbial. But one of the key things that we know that humans have done to this planet that is having an impact is changing the land cover. So for example, um, vegetation and land cover have a big impact on climate change. For example, deforestation. But the earth is huge and how significant our changes to land cover and land use have been is something we haven't really been able to take into account totally. When we make our climate models, we have to take into account vegetation cover. Um, and we often use something called potential natural vegetation. And it's usually estimated from pollen reconstructions, but it's not the same as actual land cover. And that's because of us humans. You've seen how complicated the Indus can be. Well, imagine that globally with all the different local variations, cultural variations, ecological variations mixed in. So what we actually need to have then is something called an ALCC, Anthropogenic Land Cover Change Model, where we use both the actual vegetation and what humans have done and mix it all together. And it's archeologists that are able to give this data over the long span of history to the climate modelers. So this is what the project I'm part of is doing. It's called Land Cover 6K. We're an international interdisciplinary working group that is trying to reconstruct land cover and land use across the whole of the Holocene, across the whole of the globe. And if that sounds big, it's even bigger than you're thinking, it's huge. We're part of PAGES, which is the Past Global Ch Changes Group. And we have working groups in pretty much every part of the world now. So the first thing that we've been doing is documenting and disentangling the changes between climate and other forces and human land use. We spent a huge amount of time trying to create this shared vocabulary so that we can actually have conversations between archeologists in different parts of the world, anthropologists, geographers, climate change people, so that we're all on the same page. Terminology is really important. So we've got this now, this has been published this year. And one of the things that we're now doing is we have gridded the entire planet into eight kilometer squares. And we're using this to map every single piece of land use change across the last 12,000 years. Um, normally we'd work with a one degree grid. That's what the climate modelers are normally working with. We're aiming for an eight kilometer grid, a much smaller grid, which means the climate resolution model that will come out in the end for predictive modeling in the future will be a lot better. So that's our goal. So we're working on these time slices at 12,000 years ago, 6,000, 4,000, 2,000, and then 1500 AD. We've been doing these workshops where we bring experts. Um, I think we've got over 300 scholars now. We're bringing them together to um, uh, look at the maps, tell us what they know for these different times, put it into one map, and then we give it to our GIS specialist, Dr. Chad Hill, who puts it into the computer. We then model it. We publish it so it's available for people to use and then consult with the pollen people for that actual vegetation cover and give it to the climate people to think about it. And the outcomes are super cool um, from a very archaeology nerdy point of view, but also from climate modeling point of views. So this just very quickly, and I promise I'm near the end. Um, this is our maps for 12K and 12,000 years ago and 6,000 years ago. Um, in South Asia, and then 6,000 years ago in uh, the Middle East. And it doesn't look like there's a huge amount of change, um, but there's some subtle patterns here that I think are really fun. So you can just start to see the introduction of agriculture coming into South Asia here. But the one that I think is really important is how much humans have spread into the higher altitudes and are starting to take over those. And I'm looking forward to seeing how paddy rice starts to really develop 
around about 2000 years ago and really take over this, the subcontinent in terms of the main land use and then bring, bring in sort of methane modeling and changing um, atmospheric uh, gas levels. And if you compare all of that with the Middle East, well, you can see sort of the differences, um, how farming is actually really limited to one particular part of um, the Middle East. We tend to have this idea that it's everywhere, but it's really constrained. And also thinking about pastoralism, because it's not something like the moving of animals. We often forget this, and it's really critical actually for thinking about sort of um, gas, um, sort of thinking about methane, again, with cattle and sheep and goats, but also how it's, it's, it's affecting sort of land use in different areas. So that's kind of like the sort of fine detail that we're using. It's a modeling between sort of past and present, but it's also bridging us into the future, allowing us to make those connections and give good data to the climate modelers so they have that long durée with the human element. It's a way for us to increase our predictive capacities for climate modeling and for archeologists to play a role in this, to create a resilient future. And with that um, hopeful note that we can have good models, I'm gonna say a huge thanks to the many funders and supporting bodies that have provided information and funding and support to these projects that I've mentioned. I'm gonna apologize for throwing a ton of information at you and theory and data, but hope it was interesting and useful and gives a positive tone to the climate crisis. We can learn lessons from the past. We can apply them to the future. And just to say, if there are any funding bodies out there or future people working for the funding bodies, fund archeology, span fund the social sciences, fund the humanities. You do need us. We are important. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, for that. I think everyone's just breathing a sigh of relief that we aren't doomed. Um, something we've all been hopeful for. Um, I haven't got any questions in yet. So those that missed it at the beginning, if you have any questions, do type them into the Q&A um, at the bottom and we'll fill those out to Jennifer. If you were um, just so taken aback with what you've just heard and you have some questions that you would like to pose to her afterwards, you can always email them to me and I can forward them on um, and I'm sure she'll try and help. Uh, so I did throw a huge amount of information at you all and do, I do apologise. If you're overwhelmed, I fully understand. <laughs> Very well, I understood it. I was worried when you said in the beginning, uh, but I, I understood it. So um, why we are waiting for that, maybe um, you could tell us a little bit of how you went from uh, Horsham, Leafy Horsham, and ended up in Seoul, because um, that's quite a, a distance to travel. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so... After CH, I went to Cambridge to do um, an undergraduate degree in archaeology and anthropology. Um, and I was supposed to be doing um, an undergraduate dissertation in, um, if I remember correctly, it was Iron Age geoarchaeology um, on the Isle of Wight. And it didn't quite work out the way I wanted it to. Um, and I ended up going to see my professor, um, my supervisor, and in a flood of tears and went, Cameron, it's all gone horribly wrong. Um, and he handed me a big bag of soil and said, go and talk to Carla in the lab. Um, and I did and discovered that I had a real interest in a completely different side of archaeology to the one that I thought I did. Um, did my undergraduate thesis with Cameron on, um, Professor Petrie, I should say, on um, South Asian archaeology. So completely different from UK. I was, I was going to be somebody that worked on British archaeology, who was going to go and work in a unit um, doing rescue archaeology in the UK. And instead, I ended up in my final year being sidetracked into um, archaeological science um, in South Asia. And it led to questions. So I ended up going to um, specialize a bit more at UCL for a year with a couple of specialists to hone some skills. And that led to more questions. So I did a PhD at Cambridge because I was it was annoying me that I couldn't answer these questions. Um, and that then just sort of led on to a postdoc in Cambridge, a postdoc at Brown, a postdoc at University of Pennsylvania, and then a job here. So it was it was all just because I took a chance. Um, and yeah, you might have it all planned out, but sometimes, you know, like if somebody says, well, how about this? You know, like, see what happens. OK, and loving studying from from your point of view. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so we have had a question pop up there at the end. Um, you've not mentioned much about meat or animal husbandry. Was it not a significant part of the diet? Oh, it absolutely was. The reason I haven't mentioned much about that is because oh, I should have um, I should have prefaced this with um, so I'm an archaeobotanist. My area of specialty is um, plant remains. Um, I'm I work with seeds. I work with something called a phytolith, which is a silica cast of plant cells. So that's my area of specialty. But we know that um, um, animals were absolutely a key part of the diet um, and also animal husbandry. There's some really fantastic work being done by Dr. Bad, uh, Professor Brad Chase. Sorry, I keep using the wrong titles. Professor Brad Chase from Albion College, who's been looking at how pastoralism um, was interacting with um, Indus uh, identities, for example. So that's really fun. And there's also been some really great work looking at the isotopes from um, animal teeth. So Penny Jones, who I mentioned, has done some of that as well. But um, Dr. Emma Lightfoot has also been working on this. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, animals were part of the, the diet. The main animals were sheep, goats, cows, buffalo, bit of pig. And we're increasingly now understanding um, sort of the fish based diet. A lot of fishing in the Indus and also that people were still hunting. Um, so we tend to think that when people go into agricultural land uses, they sort of don't hunt anymore. And the more we look at this big land cover project, we're realizing that these lifestyles still continue alongside the agricultural lifestyles and the pastoral lifestyles as well. Okay, and I don't know if you've um, been keeping up with what's going on at the COP. I, I can't put my hand up and say I have, but how do you feel um, that what they're suggesting uh, to try and um, make things better uh, for climate change now do you feel that they're on the right track <laughs> um some of the policies i think are going to be very useful but i think there needs to be a lot less um political squabbling and a lot more focus on actually doing things rather than setting targets um i think setting targets is not actually that useful i think there needs to be a we're actually going to do this not just let's delay it for another 10 years 20 years and that's the summation of politics, I think, there, what you just said. <laughs> I think so. I think I haven't <laughs> solved anything with that answer, but there we go. Um, I have had another question, uh, very serious. Does the increase in their use of barley suggest they were brewing more beer? This is something I'm what, really interested in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really interested in this one, actually, because identifying alcohol archaeologically is, um, it's challenging. Um, we can do residue analysis. Uh, there's some brilliant work by um, Dr. Aksheta Surinarayan. She didn't find any traces of alcohol in the ceramics she looked at through this chemical process, but that doesn't mean to say they weren't doing it. It might just not be in the ceramics that she was looking at um, or the residue method she was using. We haven't found any evidence of malting. So when you make beer, you kind of let the grains sprout a little bit. And I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, Increases in barley, I mean, they could have been doing that, but I haven't found any evidence of it yet. So let's leave it at that one, I should say. But in a sort of, well, Neolithic culture adjacent to the Indus, I'm starting to find a little bit of evidence of sprouted barley. But whether that's for beer or it's just because those grains happen to sprout is another question. So it's something I'm working on, but can't give you a definitive answer yet. Okay, and uh, we've got another one here. Were there any changes in the Himalayan glaciers around the 4.2K event? And if there were, were the changes in glacial melt likely to have played a role in the changes to the population along the Indus? Okay, so two parts to that question. The first one is changes to the glacier. Um, I'm gonna have to check on that one definitively, but as far as I know, yes, it would have been a slight change in the glacier, but we need to do a lot more work getting things like the ice cores and checking on that one. Um, I suspect that the answer will be yes, there will have been a change in the glacier. In terms of the melt and the amount, the way that that would affect the Indus, um, it's something that we need to really incorporate into our modeling because glacial melt affects the way the rivers flow, um, in particular the Indus, for example, and that may have provided more water for doing things like the watering of the wheat and the barley. 
Um, whether it affects population size, modeling population is something that um, archaeologically challenging because you can't, you have to think about birth rates, death rates and other things. We don't happen, we don't really see an increase in the number of people necessarily in the Indus based on like cemeteries, but we don't have many of those. Um, what we're seeing, particularly at that time period, is a decline in the number of people in the cities, such that the cities actually get abandoned, and then populations moving away from areas that would be affected by the glacial melt, like the River Rhine areas, into um, areas sort of further to the east. Um, whether that's a change in population numbers or it's just all the people that depopulated the cities are going to live in small villages is another question. So it's all about trying to work out how many people lived in the cities first and then whether they are the people going to live in the villages or it's just a reorganization of those settlements is another question. These are challenging. Thank you. Okay, so I don't know if you can see them popping up. I mean, it's yeah. challenging for me, but it's just leave them out. <laughs> um, so uh, I, Professor Eric Klein in his book, um, 1177 suggests there were a number of reasons for Bronze Age civilization collapse, including earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Did these also affect the Indus? Um, I'm just going to say, um, in terms of if it wasn't climate related, what did change in pirate numbers? Um, there's all sorts of possible reasons for that one. Um, it's worth, there's a website out there, I will look it up and send you the link so you can share it around, um, that talks about those variables. But in terms of the earthquake um, sort of question, that was actually one of the big discussions sort of maybe 20 years ago with the Indus, because we see at sites like um, Kalibangan, for example, where so stratigraphy is the buildup of the layers in the site, so sediments. And we see a couple of them where we've got sort of uh, the stratigraphy sort of slightly wonky. So the layers aren't lining up, you know, they're sort of doing this. Um, and people have argued that that could be caused by earthquakes. And certainly we know that the area has neotectonics that can cause all of these kind of things, um, but we don't see it at every site. And there's certainly no evidence at places like Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro for earthquake damage that's contemporary with the, with the end. So it may have had, in, there may have been small local sort of shudders and effects um, that may have caused something to happen at a couple of places but it certainly wasn't the cause of the end of the Indus um, so yeah um, but it's, it's certainly been a discussion out there whether or not neotectonics could cause rivers to shift so I've talked about the climate side of this argument there is a flip side that I didn't have time to go into which is about rivers um, and whether or not one of the rivers um, may have shifted course completely and caused the end of the Indus that's a whole other debate, and that may have been caused by tectonics. It may also have been caused by, again, the climate event. Okay, and um, and we're, we'll finish on this last one, which is also um, on topic. Does your research show any plagues? Uh, my research, personally, no, um, because it's not my area. I work with the plants, but um, the work by um, Professor Gwen Robin Shug and Dr. Nancy Lovell has been looking into this. Now we know that the health of um, Indus people was variable throughout time. Um, we have some great data from the cemeteries at Harappa. We see things like malnutrition, anemia, and there's a general underlying rumble of leprosy and tuberculosis, for example. But in the late Harappan period, we see an increase in these. It's not necessarily like plague levels or sort of, you know, pandemic levels, but it's certainly an increase in this. Um, it's probably sort of all interlinked, this idea of the late Harappan period being a period of decline, decline in sanitation, decline in food availability, increase in drought, um, and disease kind of goes with this. I suspect that the late Harappan was not a great time to live in a city because there's no food, there's no sanitation, and you're probably going to get TB or leprosy. Lovely. And uh, on that Michael, note, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, we're on we're on time anyway. So uh, that is, that is our hour. Um, I just want to say a massive thank you to Jennifer. It is bedtime um, in South Korea. <laughs> uh, she stayed up late to do this for us. Um, so thank you very much. Very interesting. And like I say, if anyone has any other questions that come to them, do let me know and I can pass them on and we'll, uh, we'll get a follow up email out to everyone. Um, from me, we have one more talk next 
Wednesday. Uh, if you're interested, please have a look on the website and you'll find the details to register there. Again, thank you, Jennifer, very much. Um, and good night. Sleep well. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for the questions. They were great. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye.